Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, we're back again with this session on perception. Now, in the last session, we looked at some models of bottom-up processing, where we define perception through a data-driven process. So, bottom-up processes actually help in perception or predict perception by looking at how perception gets built from uh, stimuli, single stimuli, and addition of the single stimuli gives rise to the perception. Another model of perception, uh, which is prevalent in cognitive psychology, is the top-down model of perception. Now, at the beginning of this lecture, I gave you the difference between what is the top-down and the bottom-up process of perception. The top down process is a theory driven process, where expectations uh, of people generate perception, whereas the bottom up process is a data driven process, where characteristics of the stimuli, certain features of the stimuli lead to whatever perception we are uh, looking for or whatever percept or the meaning that we are generating from uh, uh, the, the stimulus which is coming from sensation. So, let us begin our study of uh, the top down processes of perception. The top down process of perception also are also called the theory driven or conceptually driven uh, process of perceptions. Here expectations of the perceiver is the main responsible feature for the development of meaning or the development of percept from the uh, sensations which are passed on through the visual system. So, the whole process of perception right from uh, the meaning of the percept to pattern recognition has on the back side or on uh, behind these uh, processes the expectation of the viewer. Look at this alleyway, the same thing that we saw in a model or in the first model of uh, bottom up processing. Now, there the explanation of this visual scene was given in terms of the structure of the alleyway, in terms of uh, the shading, the light which is falling on this alleyway, uh, the kind of uh, windows it has, the kind of uh, uh, background it has and all those uh, features combined together gave a meaning of what this picture depicted. In the top down process, we again look at the same alleyway and we try to explain the meaning that is generated through the top down process. Two things that are evident that are uh, really the uh, mainframe or the backbone of uh, the top down process is the expectancy effect and the context effect. So, the basically the context effect, the effect of context in which a perception is, uh, is made and the expectancy of the viewer are responsible for the top down process. So, coming back to the explanation of this visual scene, uh, using the top down process, this visual scene is explained in terms of memory or in, in, in terms of the idea that people would have viewed a structure similar to this or maybe this particular structure somewhere. So, basically in terms of uh, uh, in, in terms of the top down process, uh, the experience that are, this is an archway with Mark Gellies uh, comes from the fact that you expect uh, certain kind of uh, uh, certain kind of visual features or certain kind of uh, objects in the visual field uh, based on your memory, based on 
uh, your previous experience with a visual scene like this, which you have seen in the real world. As I have said, the two uh, factors which the bottom up process cannot explain in terms of perception are expectancy effect and context effect. Let us look at context effect, let us look at the figure on the top. Now, as you can see, if I ask you the question whether the size of the middle ball, the, the ball or the circle at the middle of both the figures are the same and most people would actually get up with this answer that they are not same, but amazingly the size of both the balls or both the circles which are at the middle of the black circle is same. The reason being that the one on the left has bigger balls and in the context of that it appears the circle in the middle is smaller in size whereas, it is not and on the right since we have smaller balls surrounding the circle it seems to be different and so context where an object is in the environment has a lot to do with perception. Similarly, the figure on your right if I show this figure most people would go ahead and read this figure and the actual meaning of this food, uh, figure would be wonders of perception. Now, amazingly uh, word wonders of perception is not clear, but what really happens is the brain sees that or from your past experiences you see that this is the most plausible, this is the most plausible answer which is out there and so wonders of perception is being is being interpreted because you expect the brain expects and and the brain uh, sees this this particular uh, uh, idea that it should be wonders of perception. Also, since this is a class of perception, so we do see the bottom half of this figure to be meaning perception because the context in which we are studying is perception and so it should be wonders of perception and so these are the two figures or these are two examples of how perception progresses or per meaning of perception is done through the top down model. The context in which a pattern or object appears apparently sets up certain expectations in the perceiver as to what objects will occur. Now, both accuracy and the length of time needed to recognize an object vary with the context. So, the more uh, complex the context, the more time it will require for somebody to go ahead and make the meaning of the perception. Now, uh, elegant and computational model of top down process of perception was given by uh, David Marr. Now, what this uh, Marr's theory or Marr's idea is that the model of perception proceeds by perception proceeds by constructing mental representations or mental schemas. Now, perception Mars believes is a special purpose computational mechanism which progresses through certain modules and these modules are the module for analyzing color, the module for analyzing uh, uh, motion, uh, the module for analyzing shading and this part of the theory or this part of his idea is the bottom up process. He further says that with these modules, the modules for basic information about the stimulus combines with the module for expectancy and context and that generates perception. So, in, in brief Davis Marr model is basically a model which combines both bottom up and top down processes to explain perception. What David Marr believes that visual perception is are actually mental representation or mental sketches based on three kind of representations which exists uh, within the observer, within the uh, person who is perceiving. Now, there are three steps to it, there are three different uh, steps to it. When you perceive something, when somebody perceives something, the first step takes place and this is called the perceptual or the primal sketch. In the primal sketch depicts or from it from the primal sketch one can get information related to the relative brightness and darkness to the images, localized geometric structures and boundary conditions. So, this kind of uh, a basic information related to the two dimensional world related to uh, the basic brightness and darkness and geometrical structures is what, what is gathered up from the primal sketch. So, according to Davis Marv model perception progresses through a complete uh, through a list of steps. In the first step a primal sketch is made and this primal sketch is actually a two dimensional model or a two dimensional uh, 
percept which has information uh, on to it relate, uh, relating to brightnesses and darknesses and geometric structures. Now, once and uh, which uh, which basically helps people in detecting boundaries between objects and uh, figures between figures and backgrounds. Now, once the primary sketch or the primal sketch is ready the next step is constructing a two and a half D sketch. Now, in the two and a half D sketch using cues from the environment again. So, uh, both step 1 the primal sketch and 2 and a half D sketch are actually the bottom up processes of perception or the bottom up part of uh, perception which uh, this model uh, goes ahead and explains. So, the first two steps actually uses uh, data, data from the stimuli. So, in 2 and a half D sketch what really happens is that shading and texture and other uh, information for example, surfaces and relative depth are gathered from the environment or from the environmental cues uh, onto the percept and that gives an idea about where the object is in the environment, where the localization of the object and, and the kind of object it seems to be. So, the first two step in Mars, Mars's theory of perception are bottom up process. Once a two and a half D sketch is made uh, at the point when this sketch is complete, viewers have an idea of where the object is, what does it look like, what are the basic features of this object, what are the basic characteristics like the color, the shape, the shading, the boundaries, uh, the brightness, the darkness those kinds of informations uh, get available to the visual processing area. Once these two steps are complete a third and final step called the final 3 D sketch is produced where recognition of an object uh, is made in terms of the uh, in, in, in terms of the context and expectation. Here the me meaning of the visual scheme and the recognition of object is made and this happens through a top down process. So, basically Mars model combines both the top down process and the bottom up process for making any kind of percept and in very simple words what his uh, model suggests is during the primal sketch and a two and a half D sketch information relating to stimuli from basic 2 D information to uh, some sort of two and a half D information which is related to shading, localization of object in the world, depth perception, relative depths are gathered. In the final step of his process which is a top down process which is a top down uh, method uh, what really happens is that viewers expectation and memory come into play and uh, leads. Uh, people to perceive to make a final percept to make a final recognition of, our, of the object in front of him or what the object is and this information is derived from memory. Now, some examples of how this top down process really works I am going to relate now. One of the uh, best examples of or one of the best example of the top down process is something called perceptual learning. If you look at the figure on the right side when you look it for the first time you would not be able to see anything, but as you move along as you go ahead and see it time after time for multiple times what starts to emerge is a figure of a person and this happens because as you keep on seeing it a number of times some meaning uh, is generated out of it. So, what perceptual learning really means is that perception changes with practice as as we go on practicing as we go ahead and practice a lot what really happens is that we are able to generate perception. Now, very decent experiment was done by Gibson to uh, prove perceptual learning. What Gibson really did was he did an experiment a very simple experiment in which a coil like this was given to subjects this kind of coil was shown to subjects. What subjects were required to do is to remember this. Later on subjects were shown four different coils of this type, but these have different orientations. So, this ki kind of coils. So, this is my basic coil and these coils which differ from the basic coil in some or the other way in terms of orientations in the term of number of coils in the term of where the starting point is were shown to people. 
later and, and they were asked to uh, report uh, whether these four coils uh, how many of these four coils actually match the basic coil. Later on a number of different coils with different different orientations were shown to subjects and they were asked and within this this whole picture was hidden four different four versions of the initial basic coil and subjects were asked to reproduce how many uh, times did they actually go uh, how many copies of the original coil was available. Now, it was seen as that with the number of practices with the increase in the number of practices subject starts making less and less error and when uh, feedback was taken from subject what happened is most subjects related to the fact that as they kept on practicing as they kept on seeing the basic coil and practicing it they started learning that uh, or started observing those features of the stimulus which they did not see at, at the time uh, at the first time. So, as they came familiar became familiar with the subjects more and more they started noticing parts of the stimulus which they had not noticed on the first uh, advent at the in the first interaction with the stimulus. So, this is uh, an interesting uh, uh, feature or this is an interesting um, uh, 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 I would say an example of top down process where what happens is that the more number of times you interact with something the more features you would see and the your expectations are developed accordingly and more easier the learning becomes. Another interesting uh, thing or another interesting example of top down process of uh, learning or perceptual learning is something called change blindness. Now, it is the inability to detect changes uh, in objects or seen especially when given different views of that object. So, basically uh, if something is shown to you and uh, many versions or many different versions of this particular object is shown to you from different different angles people are not able to uh, detect this change and this is what is called change blindness. Now, look at the figure which is on your uh, left and you would see that one of the person right here changes, but if I do not tell you this that this is going to change you will not be able to observe. Similarly, if you look at the figure here what happens is the person at the back of at the back of the screen will change, but if I do not advise you or if I do not give you this clue that is going to change if you do not expect it, it is not going to change. Now, change blindness is a direct example is, is one of the best example to show that the brain sees what it wants to see and expectation plays a lot of role into, uh, into uh, perception. Mo uh, you have seen a lot of movies and so what really happens is that often you would have found that in movies uh, there are scenes which are inconsistent with the movie and no matter how many times uh, the editor cuts it. So, there are parts of the movies which still remain, but mo most people do not see these deviations in, in the scene, these deviations in the movie. For example, in, in one movie uh, in, in one scene there was a white wasp uh, and in, in, a, in a next scene the wasp disappeared and this was quite quite uh, funny, but the thing is that this was this particular thing was not edited. I mean the wasp uh, got uh, away or the wasp was not shown in the second scene, whereas in the third scene the wasp reappeared and so somehow the editor who was editing the movie forgot this and people since when they were watching the movie they were actually watch, watching the gist of the movie. So, they they had a certain expectation and since this wasp uh, which was there in front of them uh, it was not uh, in their expectation or they were not expecting it or they did not see that much. So, uh, they could not notice this change and so change blindness is another interesting feature of uh, the top down process. Another interesting example of the top down process is something called the word superiority effect. Look at the word which is given to you on the right, what is this word? It seems like the word is W O R R, but it is not as most people if I give them to write most people who knows English and most people who are literate if I give them they will say it is W O R K. Now, since this part that you are seeing is covered by 
uh, a black spot. And so, expectation believes that since W O R R is no word and people will not go ahead and write and so this is since I am talking about word superiority this has to be a word and it has to be work and so that that is another uh, interesting phenomena word superiority effect is another in interesting phenomena which suggests or supports uh, the idea that top down processes of perception exist. Now, interesting uh, experiment uh, was done to test word superiority effect. So, here what happened is people were shown uh, interface like this in which the letter k or d was presented to them for very brief periods of time and later on they were tested the letter k and d was presented to them and they were tested in the sense that whether or in which context do they or are they able to un, uh, to identify this k and d so the experiment ran in this way initially the letter k or d was presented to people for a very brief period of time later on they were shown this kind of three different segments in which in the first segment, the a blank slide was uh, presented and in the slide, there was a single letter k or d written on it and people were asked to uh, recall back whether k or d was presented. In the second case, a word was written, a part of the word for example, w o r was written and this d or k was presented to people and they were asked to report back whether d or k. Uh, the whether D or K was presented in the initial uh, uh, design and later on a non word was presented to them and it was asked whether uh, the D or K occurred in my presentation slide and interestingly it was found out that when this D or K was presented in the context of a word it was produced or a more uh, less number of errors were generated by participants which means that in the context of a word perception is easy. Another interesting feature uh, or an example of word superiority if, uh, uh, effect or top down processes of perception is something called the connectivist model of word perception. Now, what this model says is that per the perception of word actually uh, goes through or progresses through several stages whether it is word or whether it is a sound which is perceived the perception happens through several stages and these stages can be either excitatory or inhibitory. For example, word perception starts at the level of features where at the first step the features of the word for example, whether it is a curved line, whether it is a slanted line, whether it is a, a dash line, a circle is presented or is part of the word is first perceived and from here from the feature level it goes to the little or the level of letters. Here these features are combined together to form individual letters for example, A, C, K and so on and so forth and at a higher level there is a word level where the actual word is uh, basically being presented. So, this kind of perception really takes place. Now, what is the um, uh, what is the uh, reason or what is the meaning of all this? It basically says that from the feature level to the letter level a lesser number of connections are there whereas, from the letter level to the word level more number of connections are there. And so, what really happens is if the perception happens at the word level it is easier for people to perceive letters it uh, or uh, uh, then when it is at the level of features. What really it says is that perception of a word uh, the activation of relevant node for a word activates the node corresponding to the letter within the word thereby facilitating the perception. So, for example, if it is able that I am looking at if a word is able that I have to see what happens is this kind of connections start this kind of this is the feature level. So, the first identification of first perception is the bottom up process uh, process which starts at this level and from there this is called the letter level here this is integrated together. So, 
So, for example, if I am looking for A, the word A which is not present here. So, B L E is presented to you, A is not presented and if I am looking at whether A, A is presented or A, A should be the word here or not and uh, if A is presented to you, what really happens is that these all these features are evaluated. Now, since A does not have this feature, so this connection from here to here is an inhibitory connection, whereas since this is present in A, this is an excitatory connection. And so, since these with these many features, a number of letters can actually be generated, for example, A and T G C. And so, what happens is for each of it, we will have an excitatory or inhibitory connections. So, those connections which suggest that this is the part of the word that you are looking at or part of the feature of the word that you are looking at is is uh, uh, is present will be excitatory connections and part of the word which is not. For example, this is something which is not present in A and so these connections from here will be inhibitory. Similarly, from these letters the uh, on, on this word. So, if A is not present, uh, A is the most apt answer here. Example, N B L E is not a word and so A is the most uh, 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 possible answer T B L E is another no word and so T is not fit here, G B L E is no word and so G is not fit here and S B L E is another no word. So, basically the only word which is available in this case is A and so A is the only perception which happens and so this happens through expectation. So, at this level the if the perception happens from this level it is generally a top down process and if the perception happens from this level up it is generally the uh, bottom up process. And so, what mainly top down process suggests is that it is not only the stimulus features of the words that helps us in perception, the word perception progresses not only through basic features of the word, it also progresses through something called uh, uh, the level of expectation. Uh, that is why when we actually read in terms of reading, when we are reading something, uh, even if some word or meaning of word is uh, not clear to us based on the context on where the word is, we generate the meaning and we are able to understand the meaning of the sentence. And so, this is this is an expectancy effect where what happens is the context in which the word is presented where it appears gives us a meaning of that word or some bleak meaning of this word. So, this is the top down process of uh, perception where what uh, we actually looked at those features of the word or uh, those parts of the word where uh, uh, where perception happens through people's expectation and context effect. In what context a word is presented, what is the expectation of people that helps us in the overall perception. Another interesting theory which was given or which was uh, proposed by someone called uh, J. J. Gibson is called direct perception. Now, it is an interesting theory of perception which says that the user does not have to do anything for perception. Remember, most of our idea of perception starts with the fact that the user or the perceiver gets information from the distal stimulus does something on the proximal stimulus, generates a percept and dependent on the motivations or dependent on the expectations and context, this percept is assigned a meaning. which means that in this case up till now the theory suggests that the user does something onto the incoming stimulus and based on that a meaning is generated. Contrary to this view a theory of perception was presented by J. J. Gibson which is called the theory of direct perception. What does this theory say? This theory basically goes ahead and says that the world has a lot of information and we do not need to do anything to that information for perception to progress. So, in, in a way what J. J. Gibson goes ahead and says is that perception is a direct process and the environment that we are in, the environment that we are perceiving has enough information onto it, enough information onto the, uh, the uh, 
uh, onto the proximal stimulus which is falling on the retina. So, the proximal stimulus uh, which is a uh, part of the distal stimulus which is falling on the retina has so much information that the user has to do nothing to actually go ahead and perceive. He does not have to make a percept, he does not have to use context effect, he does not have to use some kind of a building up process using or using Mars method, uh, Mars theory of perception, but the environment on its own the user can sit back and relax the environment provides enough information for perception to progress. So, the top down process and bottom up process of perception believes that the perceiver does something to the proximal stimulus for perception to proceed and so it is called the constructivist approach. It describes people as adding to and distorting the information in the proximal stimulus to obtain a perceptive. So, what the user does is adds or subtracts information from the proximal stimulus to generate a percept which later on through the process of bottom up or top down combined gives up the meaning. Gibson adopted an opposite view to this to the connectivist approach and gave up his idea of something called direct perception. He's Gibson believes that the perceiver as I said has nothing to do or very little to do in perception. According to this view the light hitting on the retina contains highly organized information. The information that is falling onto the eye onto the retina is, uh, is, uh, uh, is so great or is has so much information or has so much bits of information that the observer is not required to do anything. Now, to prove whether Gibson was right, whether observer does not require to do anything or does a observer does not uh, require any kind of interpretation or any kind of uh, work onto the, the proximal stimulus to generate the percept, an experiment was done uh, to, to prove this. And this experiment was done by someone called uh, Johnson in 1973. So, Johnson 1973 he did an experiment. He did an experiment with light bulbs. What was the experiment? So, what he did what Johnson really did was that he attached light bulbs to actors and so these actors actually wore the light bulb. So, these are uh, uh, two actors and they have light bulbs attached to them and so, they are in two different configuration assume that these are light bulbs. And so, when an experiment like this was done these actors were actually taken into a dark room and in this dark room these actors were asked to do several um, uh, pose, poses and take several poses do several acts. There were observers who were observing this particular uh, people or these actors who were wearing light bulb shirts and from just from the way they acted just from the movement of the light bulbs they were able to uh, perceive or they were able to generate meaning or tell uh, exactly what was going on what was the actor doing. This was not the only amazing fact about it what actors could also tell or what observers could also tell from the actors who were acting was whether this actors were males and females and kind of other specific stimuluses which basically means that with very least information available from the environment with not building any information actors by just looking at uh, observers by just looking at the actors acting uh, or displaying certain forms or displaying certain acts they were able to not only uh, detect who the actors were or what are the act they were doing, but also the gender of the actor, the kind of uh, act they were doing, uh, the kind of movements that they, they were doing and several other features of it. And so, this particular experiment really proved that we really do not need a lot of information processing for perception to take place, but there is a caveat to the Gibsonian theory it is not always correct. Uh, the explanation which has been provided is that the bottom up and top down processes actually allow cognitive structures to see what the perception is whereas, the Gibsonian view actually tells you to act in certain ways to adapt that information and act in certain ways. So, this is the difference between the Gibsonian view and the view of uh, the bottom up and top down processes. So, basically what Gibson design or Gibson's theory uh, comes up and says that uh, he developed the Gibson developed his theory of direct perception 
when he was training World War II pilots and what he realized or he gave the concept of optic flow. If you look at the stimulus here, what he did was in a number of experiments uh, with pilots who were uh, taking training or who were going ahead and, and landing planes, what Gibson explained that the pilot when he sees information, when he sees out of his windshield, he gets enough information from the environment which is approaching him, uh, the texture, the structure, the kind of uh, movement uh, which is there, the ground movement, the ground color, all this information was enough for to tell the pilot of how to land the plane. And so, what Gibson proposed is that the idea of something called optic flows or visual arrays. And as you can see here, this is the pilot who is landing and when he is landing, just before landing, he sees all this information about texture structure, uh, kind of relative speed, for example, things which are uh, closer to the pilot will move at uh, higher speeds than the uh, than the things which are far away and these kind of informations which the pilot gets is enough for him to land a plane. He should not be or he need not be concentrating on information which is providing by his uh, uh, display system and so that is where he gave this idea of optic flow. The, so, the arrow in this particular thing represent perceived movement, apparent motion of clouds, ground etcetera with respect to the pilot. Now, there is a texture of the motion namely nearest things will appear faster and, uh, and directions in which object seems to move oppo opposite depends on the angle of plane and movement. And so, this particular example uh, was one of the uh, best example which Gibson used to propose the idea that there is something called direct perception. The observer does not need too much information, the observer does not need to work on the information which is being uh, which is being presented to him. The environment presents a lot of information to him and that information uh, the, obje uh, the observer only has to understand that information not even make meaning out of it and just follow that information and that is what uh, uh, Gibson's idea of perception direct perception was. Uh, was there. So, what Gibson says is that the information that is available from the environment for the observer uh, exists in an animal environment uh, uh, ecosystem. So, basically the environment pro uh, uh, provides some information to the animal and the animal provides certain kind of cognitive structures or selects which information from the environment to take. Uh, to take and based on these two kinds of interactions the perception uh, progresses. So, the animal decides the animal only has to decide what information to take from the environment and this decision process is the core of perception. Whereas, the environment on its own can provide a lot of information and this decision process is the main key to act actually any kind of perception according to uh, Gibsonian uh, views. Now, for Gibson, the central question of perception is not how we make and interpret a stimulus array, but how we see and navigate among real things. So, it is what Gibson believes is it is all about functions. It is not important to study in terms of perception of how and what we interpret from stimulus arrays, what a particular stimulus really means that is not important. What really important is is known that an object is there, how do we navigate through it. So, navigation in the environment is more important than having any percept, than realizing or then understanding what the percept really means. So, the basic idea uh, of Gibsonian view is to understand what the environment, how to navigate the environment rather than knowing what the environment has. Now, important idea of Gibsonian theory is the information available in an organism exists not merely in the environment, but in the anima environment in uh, an uh, animal ecosystem. As I was just explaining to you, what really happens is that the job of the animal here, the job of the person who is perceiving here is to decide what to take in from uh, the percept which is available. What he has to do is that the environment gives enough of information to the person, the person only has to decide what information to take and what information not to take. And concept which is related to the Gibsonian theory or the Gibsonian idea of perception is the concept of affordance. Now, what really it means is that organisms directly perceive shape or whole object and then objects gives have uh, uh, something called an affordance. Now, what affordance really means is that an object which you are perceiving 
it directs you to do certain act on it and that is called an uh, affordance. For example, think of a chair. Now, when you look at a chair or when you think of a chair, the idea that the chair gives to you, the affordance that the chair gives to you is sitting. Similarly, if you look at a button, a light button, now a light button gives you the affordance to be, pre uh, to be pressed down or looking at if you have printers at home and if you think about the printers power button, the red light, the green light which is on it is off when it is off, when you press it, it gives you the affordance to be pressed down. Similarly, doors handle or uh, the handle of uh, uh, glass doors give you affordances or tell you what to do. For example, if I have a handle like this, it gives you the affordance to put your palm onto it and push. Whereas, if I have a handle like this, it gives the affordance to, to uh, basically hold it and pull it towards yourself, because this requires you to wrapping your hand here, whereas this requires you to push it with this hand. Now, often this is uh, a little, little bit confused or peop people confuse with this kind of affordances. So, affordances is what an object requires or desires to be done. So, basically here the definition is given as affordances are the acts or behaviors permitted by an object place or even. For example, door knobs tell you to there is a round, round door knob. So, it, uh, it the door knob tells you to grab it and to turn it down. Similarly, uh, the affordance of a chair for sitting or any other affordance of a light bulb for push, uh, pushing or light uh, switches to be pushing it down or affordances of door handles to be either pulled or pushed and these are what affordances are. And so, what Gibson says is that objects in itself have affordances. Objects have affordances and these affordances guide people's behavior of what should be done and what should not be done. Now, the obvious question is on one hand we have Gibsonian view and on the other hand we have the bottom up and top down the classical uh, uh, approaches to perception. So, is there a merger between them? How can these theories coexist? What is the way in which these theories can coexist? And so, a model was proposed by Nicer in the year 1976, which takes care of both the theories, which in which uh, uh, which adds up both the theories to develop the final percept. And this is theory is called the perceptual cycle. Now, what this theory or what this approach goes ahead and tells is that this perceptual cycle says there are the integration of the Gibsonian view and the view of the classical approach to perception combines to this way. For example, the information of the world is here and this is modified by cognitive structures through perception that forwards or directs exploration in certain way and this will further suggest what should be taken from the environment or sample from the environment. So, what does this theory really say? It says that the information of the world, whatever information perceptual information is available into this world that is modified or that is being perceived or that gets perceived, perceived uh, through a classical approach of perception using different cognitive structures. So, the visual cognitive structures of perception, cognitive structures of attention, these structures or higher order structures uh, leads to uh, perception either using the bottom of the uh, bottom up or top down approach, it leads to perception, it leads to the generation of the percept. When the percept is generated, this percept leads us to explore the environment, to explore, to do certain acts. When we do certain acts, when we do a particular act based on the perception, we present a behavior, we do a behavior, we commit a behavior and when a behavior is there, we explore, this exploration tells us what is possible and what is not possible. Once a behavior is done, it directs which type of behavior or which type of actions can be done through the percept. So, if I perceive something, what that particular thing. Uh, 
uh, when when behaving with it, what particular particular thing, information, uh, what behavior is allowed and what behavior is not. And once we know what behavior is allowed and what behavior is not, we feed this uh, again to the environment, and from there it again gets modified in this way. So basically, information from the world is actually uh, gets modified and generates a percept, which is later on this percept is tested in the environment in terms of whether what behaviors are possible on this percept, what behaviors can this percept generate and which of this behavior is allowable or not. Those behavior which is allowable gets added up into the information in the world of a particular thing and whatever behavior is not allowed is deleted here or is not added and that information is also added. For example, think of a teacup. Now, the kind of a teacup if we have, there are certain behaviors which is allowable. When we see it, we see a teacup and so when we are looking at a teacup, then it, there is a certain orientation with it and there is a certain feature that it allows. For example, it allows us to, tea, uh, to drink tea, but if we try to do something else with it by moving the geon in certain way, that is not allowed in certain behaviors. For example, drinking is a behavior which is allowed and other behaviors uh, using this as something else or using this uh, for looking at things or doing something else with it, the behaviors uh, are not allowed and that is fed into environment and based on that our perception is improved or enriched. So, the next time we uh, deal with this cup or this kind of a percept, we know what is to be done and what is to be uh, not done and the perception then becomes automatic. The whole of this perceptual processes is done so as to make this whole idea of perception automatic, so that something, uh, something what, what is allowable is accepted and what is not allowable is not accepted and it goes into memory. So, that a next time a new instance of this behavior, a new instance of this percept is generated, it does not take that much time for perception. So, basically perception in this section of perception we looked at, we started with the classical approach where we looked at some classical theories, the gestalt ideas of how what uh, perceptual organization is and how this perceptual organization really works what is the figure background concept and how the figure and background decides how uh, what should what is to be perceived what information is to be generated and what is information is to be left behind now uh, this idea was added on to some models or added on to this where some models of perception we started up in the uh, in the next lecture on some models of uh, top down processing where uh, sorry bottom up processing where we looked at uh, models of template matching, prototype matching and so these models actually uh, showed how perception progress through a data different uh, data driven approach in which we look at ba basic stimulus features is uh, take these feature combine them together and once we have combined all these features together how does the percept develop out of it. In this per particular lecture we looked at another approach of perception in which the data driven approach is supported by something called the theory driven approach. So, perception is not only taking in data from the environment combining together and generating a percept, this perception process is also helped or is, is also influenced by something called the expectation and, and something called the uh, the context in which a particular object is present. And so, context and expectation adds on to uh, the data driven approach to give you the final perception. For example, if you look at something which is new, which you have not looked before, a part of information which is coming to you, you will look at its shading, you will look at uh, uh, the kind of brightness, the figure and all those basic informations. Plus, you will also look at your memory to look at to understand what is this particular thing and based on that you combine these two information together to generate this idea of perception. Now, in addition to that there is an idea or there is a whole theory of direct perception which says that the object by itself by uh, by being where it is in the environment offers you uh, some information as to what it is and where it is. The place at which is present the kind of uh, uh, information that is relayed when you are looking at it is should also in addition provides you what uh, kind of uh, things you should do with it and you should not do with it. Take an example. Let us say we have a UFO which has landed somewhere and crash landed somewhere. So, when you see further obviously, we have some idea of what an UFO is. So, next time when you see something which is circular and flying which has landed somewhere, you 
both your uh, the top down process and bottom up process will work together. So, when you go to the crash site you see something which is circular something which has um, uh, with, uh, which has stands on it from where there is uh, some kind of uh, air movement coming in where the fans would be on an on an UFO where uh, it, it would take off and things like that. So, you combine these informations together to to get the concept of what a UFO is plus in terms of the fact that in numerous movies you have seen that a disc life shape which has fans and which has doors and which is of a certain way should look like a UFO or should be UFO that information combined with you actually presently seeing that particular UFO in a particular uh, environment combines together to give the concept that this is an UFO. What direct perception would come in and say that being where it is being where the UFO is in, in itself allows you to do certain acts. For example, from your experiences you, you understand that there is a door and so the in an UFO where from where people from other environments will come. So, certain behavior you it will it will lead you doing uh, that behavior and certain behavior it will uh, it will not allow you to do. For example, if there is no door in a, in an in an uh, or there is a the, the crack in, in, in the UFO, it will give you an affordance to basically go ahead and push it and realize the door because most of the movies do not tell you where is the door in, in the UFO. So, this affordance will tell you if the crack is there from where the light is coming on from the UFO, you will have this affordance that this is the door and that itself should be enough for you pushing in and your expectation of what should be inside will guide you of what you are going to uh, see when you go inside that place, when you go inside that UFO, maybe green man's coming in and, and, and uh, maybe taking you for a, a probe, a aerial probe or whatever you wish to uh, come up with, but this is how perception progresses. So, the whole idea of perception is uh, what I have presented in this lecture. In the next lecture, we will go ahead and look at what is attention and look at the theories of attention. Thank you.